Hey everyone, my name is Becca and welcome to my channel. Uh, if this is the first time you're here with us, welcome. And if you have read a first chapter with us before, welcome back. I'm super excited because we are going to be reading the first chapter, actually the first two chapters because the first chapter is super short, of Iceberg by Jennifer Nielsen. So this is a book about the Titanic and I don't know about you all, but I have always been intrigued and infatuated by the Titanic and the storyline and the storyline of the passengers. And um, I just think it's a really um, engaging topic to read about. So I was super excited when Jennifer Nielsen uh, wrote this new book, Iceberg. So uh, without further ado, let's dive into the front synopsis on the inside cover of the book. A mystery not meant to be solved, a ship never meant to sink, the adventure of a lifetime. Hazel Rothbury is traveling all alone from her home in England aboard the celebrated ship, Titanic. Following the untimely death of her father, Hazel's mother is sending her to the United States to work in a factory so that she might send money back home to help her family make ends meet. But Hazel harbors a secret dream. She wants to be a journalist and she just knows that if she can write and sell a story about the Titanic's maiden voyage, she could earn enough money to support her family and not have to go to a sweatshop. When Hazel discovers that her mother didn't send her with enough money for a ticket, she decides she must stow away on board the storage ship. With the help of a porter named Charlie and a sweet first class passenger named Sylvia, Hazel explores the opulent ship in secret but a haunting mystery quickly finds her. The danger only intensifies when calamity strikes. The readers will be caught up in the terror and suspense alongside Hazel as she fights to save her friends and herself. Ooh, I'm really excited to share this with you. So, um, all right. Teachers, real quick, if you are reading this with your students, in the description there is a link to a free handout that you can give to your kiddos to follow along with this first chapter, first two chapters of Iceberg. All right, let's dive on in. I can barely wait. Chapter one, before the end came. In the end, in those final moments before the Titanic sank into its grave, some people would jump overboard taking their chances in the icy water. They had little hope of surviving, but if they continued clinging to the rails, they'd have no chance at all. Others resigned to their fate, stepped back and listened to the small group of musicians playing on even as the water crept higher onto the deck. Maybe that was better to seek peace in the inevitable. Others still made themselves heroes in the end working until their last breath was swallowed up in an ocean of water, hoping to give those on deck another minute of life. They might have proven themselves to be the finest among us. Yet the stories will be told of those who had no choice. Stories of those who ran for the nearest stairwells, hoping to reach a higher deck or praying for the chance to reach a lifeboat, but found themselves trapped behind watertight doors with no chance to survive. I know these stories are true because I was one of them. All right, chapter two. Like I said, chapter one was very short. That's why we're doing two chapters. Chapter two, everything seemed perfect. Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. A British legend from 900 years ago describes the Viking King Canute who had his throne carried to the shores of Southampton there on the beach, he stood before the mighty ocean and commanded the incoming tide to stop so as not to wet his royal robes. But the water was indifferent to the command and flowed onto the shores, soaking the great king's robes. Dripping with ocean water, the king turned to his followers to say, even with all my power, I am nothing compared to the heavens and earth. I worship the heavens and I respect the might of this world. My father used to tell me that story every time he returned from his fishing trips, but that was years ago. I was 12 years, I was 12 years old now and far older in my mind as I'd never cared much for childish things, except for Papa's story. I did used to love that and every word came rushing back to me on the day I first saw the Titanic. 
because here I was now on the very same shores of Southampton, England. Although I wasn't down on the beach, but up, but on the port above it, staring up at a ship that aimed to defy King Canute's words. The Titanic was everything the papers had described, as powerful as the titans of mythology and as elegant as if it were a floating castle. It did not respect the might of this world because it was the might of this world. The Titanic was also the largest man-made moving object in the world, taller than the great pyramids of Egypt or any cathedral of Europe, as long as four city blocks. Each of its four smokestacks was wide enough that a locomotive could drive through it, and its anchors were said to weigh 15 tons each. Indeed, the Titanic was so bold in appearance that the newspapers called it the world's first unsinkable ship. The ship that claimed it would command the very tides of the ocean. I'd done my research. On a four-day walk from my home in the southern tip of England to the ports of Southampton, I pulled newspapers from every rubbish bin I could find, scouring the pages for any information on the White Star Line's newest and grandest ship. But reading about it did little to prepare me for the wonder of actually seeing it. I wasn't the only one standing in awe. The vast, a vast crowd had gathered to watch the Titanic depart on its maiden voyage. I couldn't begin to guess how many people had come, but surely it was in the tens of thousands. Men lifted children to their shoulders and women, women stood on their toes for a better look at the ship or to crane their necks in hope of seeing any of the wealthy and famous passengers. Those passengers weren't boarding here at the dock level, naturally. If life had elevated them above us common folk, then the gangplank itself also had to be elevated. The wealthiest passengers had a separate entrance, bringing them directly into the upper decks of the ship. Meanwhile, those of us in the poorer class moved among the cargo, waiting in endless lines for what appeared to be a doctor's inspection before we would be allowed on board. The variety of people in line amazed me. I had never seen so many people who must have come from all parts of the world. Some traveled alone and others with entire families. I understood the gleam in their eyes, the excitement of being part of this adventure of traveling to a new country. America was supposed to be a land where even the poorest person had the chance to build a life for themselves, sometimes even to find wealth. That wouldn't be my future. Papa had died two years ago during a storm at sea. Mom had done her best to support us, but each month we had fallen further behind. And then two weeks ago, we had received a letter from Mom's sister in America. She had heard of our difficulties and was inviting me to come to America to work alongside her in a garment factory. The work would be difficult and sometimes dangerous, she'd said, but I could board with her free of charge, then send nearly everything I earned home to my family. While mom had read me the letter, her forehead had lined with wrinkles, each line deeper than the one above it. And when she finished, she set it down saying, I'm so very sorry, Hazel. What do you think? I thought it sounded horrible. Until that letter came, I'd had big dreams for my life, plans and possibilities that filled my imagination. I was going to make something of my life. The letter from my aunt ended those dreams. I wanted to tell my mom no, even to beg her to let me stay in England, but I couldn't do it. Not when every rainstorm brought dripping water through our roof, not when all four of my younger brothers needed new shoes and went barefoot most of the time. Mom had recently sold her wedding ring to pay a debt that was overdue. The truth was that there were no dreams to be had here at home. So I made myself smile back at mom and said, I'll go. She had wrapped me in her arms. You are a better daughter than I deserve. The amount that you earn may save our family and perhaps in time, it'll prove to be a good thing for you too. Perhaps, but I rather doubted it. That was how I ended up here at the Southampton port, staring up at the ship destined to carry me to America with every last farthing mom could scrape up to pay for my passage. Finally, it was my turn in line at the ticket booth. Third class ticket, I told the woman inside the booth, traveling alone and I'm willing to share my room if they don't snore too loud. She had frowned back at me and answered, three pounds. 
Mom had given me a shoulder bag to hold the money and enough food for my walk, so I'd spend nothing along the way. But I knew that there were barely over two pounds inside the bag. Not enough. I asked the woman, how much if they do snore loud? Prices in third class go up to eight pounds, she frowned at me, and then looked at the next person uh, behind me in line. Next, please. And just like that, I was out of line. I turned to face the ship again. The easiest answer to the what now question looming ahead of me was to return home. After all, I had the perfect excuse. But I remembered mom's last words to me before I left. She had hugged me tight and then said, if I didn't believe this is the only way to save our family, I wouldn't give you up for anything in the world. I needed to get on board that ship with or without a ticket. I wouldn't get through on third class gangplank. The officers taking tickets were watching for stowaways. For on the few occasions I saw passengers slinking back down the gangplank, obviously turned away. That's what would happen to me. There had to be another way. I was so intent on studying the ship that I jumped when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to see a rather pretty girl in a light blue dress with a lace collar and with a very fine hat over her long blonde hair curled at the ends. If she stood still enough, I'd almost believe she was a museum painting. In my first look at her, I already understood who she was. Mum said some people breathed wealth. They inhaled air, but exhaled money, getting richer almost without trying. This girl breathed wealth. Pardon me, she said, but I've become separated from my governess. Have you seen her? A tall, slender woman dressed all in black? I haven't seen her. I tried to speak with the same polite tone as she had used, but my words sounded as ordinary as I was, standing in my coarse fabric dress without a single stitch of lace and an old coat that had belonged to Papa too long for me. I had no hat and my brown hair would have been in tangles if I had not taken the trouble this morning to pull it into two braids. The girl smiled kindly. My name is Sylvia Thorngood. I arched a brow. Any relation to Edgar Thorngood? He's my father. I couldn't stop my jaw from dropping wide open. Everyone knew that name, even here in England. The family fortune was said to be worth over a million dollars. What's your name, Sylvia asked. Hazel Rothbury. Rothbury. She spoke slowly, letting my name flow over her tongue, as if a slow pronunciation would help her recall which of her father's wealthy friends I was related to. The answer was simple. None of them. Still, Sylvia widened her smile. I'm very happy to meet you. Are you boarding the ship as well? Yes, I'm traveling to America. I'd already noticed the difference in her accents. You must be going home. I am. I've been in England with my governess visiting my grandparents. Who will you be visiting in America? I opened my mouth, but had no idea how to answer. It was humiliating to explain that my journey would end in a garment factory, changing bobbins or threading needles for 10 hours a day. Sylvia was looking at me like a friend. I didn't want her to think of me as a servant. So I only said, I'll be staying with my aunt in New York. That was the most I wanted to say about that. Oh, there's so much to see and do in New York, she said. You will have such a wonderful time. Well, Mrs. Thorngood, there you are. The woman hurrying toward us was tall and rail, rail thin, with graying hair pulled back into a tight bun and wearing layers of black. Either she was in mourning or else miserable old spinsters had inspired her sad fashion choices. My apologies, Miss Gruber. I became lost, but now I've met a new friend. Sylvia gestured toward me. Miss Hazel Rothbury is headed to New York to stay with her aunt. Perhaps we could have them over for supper one evening. I flushed with embarrassment and quietly said, I don't think my aunt would not know your family. Oh, the Thorn Goods know everyone in New York's high society. Miss Gruber eyed the shoulder bag at my side. No luggage? I had a long walk here, couldn't pack much with me. And you have a ticket? I couldn't admit the truth, not with Miss Gruber already looking down on me, literally. So I nodded, of course I do. Sylvia clapped her hands together. I have such a lovely idea. Let's not wait until we reach New York to know each other better. Perhaps one evening you might join us on the ship. There won't be many people on board our age, so let's decide to be friends now. That would be fun, I agreed. I had no intention of ever meeting her for a meal. I feel lucky enough just to get onto this ship. 
Miss Rothbury will likely be too busy washing and ironing her dress to have time for supper, Miss Gruber observed. That might be true. On my walk to Southampton, I had to sleep in a barn each night and often tramped through the cold rain along muddy shoes, muddy roads. If Miss Gruber understood why my dress was dirty, maybe she would not have been so sharp with me now. Or maybe she was so sharp because she understood that, because the very fact that I had been bold enough to speak to her, Ward, was offense enough. Come now, Miss Thorgood, Miss Gruber said. Have a pleasant voyage, Miss Rothbury. The tone of her voice was unmistakable. She didn't care whether my voyage was pleasant or the greatest disaster of the century. She just didn't want me to interfere with her voyage. I waved goodbye, then headed toward the stern of the ship where passengers had deposited their trunks and large pieces of baggage to be transported into the Titanic's cargo hold. Crewmen were busy loading each piece, but each time they left each time they left with a piece of luggage, I had two or three minutes to look around. Most of the trunks I saw were locked from the outside or had exterior latches. Finally, I found a simpler one that merely closed. I opened it and saw it was filled with a woman's clothes. It took some effort to fit inside and still have room to breathe, but I did it and lowered the lid without being noticed. This was a terrible idea. I knew that as well as I knew this was breaking the law, a disgrace to my family's good reputation and likely a fair amount dangerous. But it was the only plan I had. Several minutes later, the trunk was picked up by a crewman who then called, Oi, this one's heavy. Lend a hand, mate. A second crewman came to pick up the trunk. And before I knew it, I was being carried on board the Titanic. Ooh. All right, well, that certainly roped me in. I don't know about you. If you plan on reading this book or if you've already read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing so you can be notified when we have another book come out for First Chapter Friday. Or any day, really, because is there ever a wrong day to start a new book? All right, friends, hope to see you again soon.